Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects, I want to give you something of a preview of the next couple of weeks. We'll be looking at three kinds of basic amplifier configurations. And I'm using the term pre-amplifier to distinguish these kinds of circuits from the power amplifiers that actually drive speakers. Those are kind of their own thing. They'll have their own lectures, although the underlying ideas that we're talking about now will apply to those power amplifiers as well. The specific details here is that we're taking a voltage in and we're going to amplify it and or buffer it in some way and produce a voltage out. The most common kind of gain stage you'll find in a guitar amplifier is the common cathode configuration. This is equivalent to the common emitter amplifier structures that you'll see with bipolar junction transistors or the common source amplifiers you'll see with field effect transistors. Although there's a slight difference in the bias scheme compared to what you're probably used to seeing, which we'll talk about in a second. Remember that under normal operating conditions, the grid of the triode doesn't conduct. There's usually a grid leak resistor that's placed here, and this is usually pretty large, something like one mega ohm, and this basically provides a DC path to ground, so if any extraneous electrons start to build up on this grid that shouldn't be there, they've got some place to go. So this grid resistor is basically what defines the input impedance of this kind of configuration. And when I redraw this in terms of the small signal analysis, I'll often just leave this out and assume that you can put it back in later because it doesn't really affect the remainder of the analysis. So the input goes into the grid and we're taking the input out of the plate. And I'm going to use an RL here to indicate a load resistance. And I want to emphasize that this load resistor is something that we're including as a fundamental part of this amplifier configuration. The term load here is not representing some further circuitry that we're feeding. Depending on the approach we want to take to analyze things, we'll often redo the analysis with the load provided by the rest of the circuitry in parallel with this intentional load resistor. So down here at the cathode, I've put two different resistors. One of them is in series with a capacitor. And for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to treat capacitors as magical things that are either shorts or open circuits, depending on what analysis I'm doing. Later in the course, we'll look at the idea of using open circuit time constants and short circuit time constants in order to try to develop an intuition as to what effect the capacitors actually have on the frequency response of our circuits. But now we'll treat them as being shorted or open, depending on what we're doing. So when we're considering the DC bias operating points of this circuit, this capacitor is basically an open circuit. But when we consider the small signal behavior of the circuit, we'll treat this as a short and we'll have these two resistors in parallel. The common cathode configuration is an inverting amplifier configuration that can give you tons of gain if you want it. The common plate configuration, on the other hand, doesn't give you a ton of gain. In fact, it doesn't really give you gain at all. It's going to give you a gain factor that's less than one, but it is non-inverting. The nice thing about it is that it has a very low output impedance, so this forms a nice voltage buffer, and hence often goes by the name cathode follower. So this is like an emitter follower in the BJT realm or a source follower in the MOSFET realm. Notice that the common cathode and the common plate configurations have a lot of similarities. In both cases, the input goes into the grid. The main difference is where we're taking the output. And in fact, there's something called the cathodine configuration where you actually use both outputs. If you're just using this configuration as a cathode follower, you'll often emit this RL. So the plate is just hooked to the positive voltage rail. Now let's talk about biasing for a second. It probably looks strange to you that we're just jamming the input directly into the grid. If you think about the various amplifier configurations you've seen using BJTs and MOSFETs, you're probably used to seeing a capacitor here at the input, and then you're used to seeing resistors going to the positive rail voltage, where 
this resistor network creates a bias voltage for this particular point, and then the capacitors act as DC blocks. And there are cases in guitar amplifiers and other amplifiers that use this kind of fixed bias scheme. But it's more common to see this particular self-bias scheme. This kind of bias scheme is something we're going to look at a lot in the next lecture. And this is something you can really only do with tubes and depletion mode transistors like depletion mode MOSFETs and junction FETs, JFETs. So the common grid configuration, also called grounded grid, when it's used in a particular bias scheme where the grid is in fact grounded, is not something that really shows up on its own in audio amplifiers. It does show up in some radio frequency amplifier applications, but those applications are pretty specialized. So with the common grid configuration, you take the output from the plate, like with the common cathode, but you inject the input into the cathode instead of the grid. And here we do need a distinct DC block capacitor in order to block the DC voltage at this node from the input. The main disadvantage of this configuration is that it has a mediocre input impedance. Basically, you'll see an input impedance of this RK in parallel with whatever the input impedance seen looking into this cathode is. We'll get into all of that in a future lecture. I'm covering it here because although we won't really be using the common grid amplifier by itself, this is a useful building block for understanding some more complicated multiple tube amplifier structures. When multiple amplifiers are chained together in some way, there's usually a DC blocking capacitor between the output of one stage and the input of another. Modern electrical engineers refer to this as capacitive coupling. I do want to warn you that if you find an extremely old textbook on vacuum tube circuits, which a lot of them are very old, you'll see this kind of capacitive coupling very confusingly referred to as resistive coupling. I don't know why they did that. I think that's in contrast with coupling with transformers, which is something you'll see in a lot of very old tube designs. You'll see that in old radios and even some old amplifiers. I think that mostly is a result of a time where the available capacitors were extremely poor. I'm not sure. Now, sometimes people will take the output of one stage and just jam it right into the input of another stage. So you might have this going right into some sort of grid. This kind of configuration here is referred to as fixed plate biasing. So that's a very different kind of bias scheme for the next stage. Basically, the DC bias point of the first stage here is setting the DC bias point of the grid for the next stage. We'll get into these issues later in the class. So in the last lecture, we developed a small signal model for triodes. Actually, we developed two models. One was a parallel model with a current source, and the other was this series model with a voltage source. Now, the voltage source consists of the voltage measured between the grid and the cathode. Remember, I'm using these symbols to represent measurements relative to the ground. Anyway, it's the voltage between the grid and the cathode times this amplification factor mu, in series with a dynamic resistance RP. Now remember, RP is part of the linearization. It's part of the model we derived. It's not representing something like, say, the resistance of the lead that's going to the plate or something like that. So RP changes with the DC bias current, but fortunately, mu stays constant for a wide range of operating currents, and it really only drops down at very low currents. So because of the dependability of mu, this series model is very natural for triodes. This is in contrast with transistors, where a parallel model with a current source is usually more natural. So each of these amplifier configurations is going to get its own lecture, or in some cases, more than one lecture. But for now, what I would like to do is just take each of these and break it out into its DC and small signal AC circuits. So we're going to approximate the behavior of the common cathode amplifier as being this DC biasing network with this small signal circuit superimposed on top of it. So to figure out the biasing behavior, we zero out the input and we open up the capacitor.
So we only have RK and RL left as part of the biasing configuration, and we don't have RKC. Recall that our notation for the complete voltage was a lowercase v here with a subscript that's capital letters, and the DC voltage is all capital, and the small signal voltages are all lowercase. When considering the small signal circuit, I replaced this DC voltage with ground, and I put a little AC here to remind ourselves that it started out as a DC voltage, and this is a small signal ground. I may or may not do this in general. I want to emphasize the point here. Now, I've replaced RK in parallel with RKC with what I've called RKAC. This is sort of like a cathode resistance for the small signal circuit. So in deriving the small signal circuit, I've just replaced this capacitor with a short circuit. In later lectures, we'll get into more detail about exactly what this does to your frequency response. But for now, we'll just assume it's a short. The decomposition of a common plate amplifier, which is analogous to a common collector or a common drain amplifier, is quite similar to that of a common cathode amplifier. We're basically taking the output from a different spot, taking it from the cathode instead of from the plate, and we don't have any capacitors or RKC to worry about, so it's actually an overall simpler circuit. And as I mentioned before, unless you're making a cathodyne, you wind up usually just leaving out RL. So your voltage source, or in this case, your AC ground, is connected directly to the plate. So for the common grid amplifier, if you were to open up this capacitor to figure out the DC bias network, you get something like this. And in the case of figuring out what the small signal gain is, again, I'm just assuming that this capacitor is a short, well, as far as figuring out what the gain is, if you're assuming that Vn here is an ideal voltage source, it's connected directly to the cathode, so you could just ignore this RK entirely. As I mentioned before, we won't really be thinking about the common grid amplifier by itself. We will talk about it, but we'll primarily use it as a building block to understand some more complicated multi-tube structures. So here's the small signal circuits for those three amplifier types placed side by side. You'll see that although there are some differences between them, they are quite similar, and we'll use some similar tools. A technique I picked up from my colleague Marshall Leach is to make extensive use of Thevenin equivalents. So I'm going to develop a Thevenin equivalent for looking into the plate in terms of Thevenin equivalents for what's on the other side of the cathode. And we're going to use that to analyze the common cathode and common grid configurations. And I'm also going to develop a Thevenin equivalent for looking up into the cathode in terms of a Thevenin equivalent of the impedance on the other side of the tube over here on the plate side to analyze the cathode follower. And we'll spend quite a few lectures doing that kind of thing. And here's the DC bias networks for the three different amplifier configurations. And notice, these are all the same. Remember, these are for self-biasing configurations. There are other ways to bias these circuits. But we're mostly going to be looking at self-bias circuits. And what we're calling V out doesn't really even matter as far as considering the biasing goes. So everything we're going to learn about biasing for one configuration, we can pretty much apply to the others. So that will turn out to be convenient. In particular, in the next lecture, we'll look at biasing a common cathode amplifier. So if you are not one of my Georgia Tech students taking this for class credit, you can tune out here. If you are one of my students, you should go to Canvas, and there you will find a quiz labeled three kinds quiz. And there are four questions on this quiz. And these are questions about your most favorite and least favorite class that you've taken at Georgia Tech, excluding any classes that I may have taught you in the past. So excluding classes that you've had with me. First question, what is your most favorite class? And second question is, what was your favorite thing about that class? The third question, 
is what has been your least favorite class that you've taken at Georgia Tech? And the fourth question, what is the thing you most disliked about that class? I'm just curious. I will keep this information to myself and not distribute it any further. It will remain private.